So, that was all preamble to explain what was going on here. Let's now have a look at the solution. I'm going to start with part one. This is the easy part. You just had to work out what S3 and S4 were, right? Now, what we get told, the data in the question, I'll just write this in a, a separate color so that I can distinguish it. You get told the first term, uh, S1 is 1, you get told that S2, the second term, is 2, and then you get your recursive formula. Um, these two feed into the fact that to get all the rest of the numbers, you say look at the previous term, Sn minus 1, um, you then multiply the previous to that term by n minus 1. So that's why you've got um, the previous term and the one before that, okay? So, for part one, it's fairly straightforward, right? We want to say, well, S3 is going to depend on S2 and S1. So, it's going to be the previous term plus two lots of the term before that. We know that the previous term was 2, the first term was 1, so we just get S3 being equal to 4. And then you just rehearse that logic for S4. So you say, well, it's the previous term and it's three lots of the term before that. So you're going to get, we just worked out S3, um, which is four. Um, and this is going to be three lots of two. So you get 10. You can see why this is just one mark, okay? Potentially one of the easiest marks in any extension to a four unit exam ever, okay? Now part two then says, what are we required to prove? We need to show that the square root of x plus x is going to be greater than or equal to the square root of x, x plus one. And the domain restriction is for um, real numbers for all, I'll just write this, for all uh, real numbers x, and I think it's just strictly, no, it's not actually strictly positive. You can include zero, okay? Because um, of course we can, once you put x equals zero, it's just a trivial result. All right, how do we do this? Now, there's a bunch of different ways to solve this inequality, um, but I think the most direct way is to notice that because you've got a square root of everything on the right-hand side of this inequality, what you can think about is the square of everything there uh, on the left-hand side and the right-hand side, and then at the end, we can take the square roots, and I'll, I'll sort of explain the logic for that in a second, right? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say, let's consider um, the left-hand side squared. So that's going to be the square root of x plus x all squared. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to work with this thing and then towards, once my logic is a bit clearer, I can take the square root of this and I'll have the left-hand side, okay? So I'm just going to expand the binomial. This is going to be um, square the first, let's double the product in the middle and then I will square the last. There we go, okay? But I can say, hey, hold up. You see this term, or this expression rather, here on the right hand side, right? It's got an x and an x squared. That, that's what you have here, right? This thing underneath the, the square root sign is um, x plus x squared. So uh, this thing here in the middle is actually kind of unnecessary. It's not related. Um, I can say though, it's bigger, right? x times the square root of x, since x has to be greater than or equal to zero, um, it's going to make this bigger, right? So I can say, here's my logic. I'll put it in another color just so you can see me reasoning it. I can say, but um, x plus 2x root x plus x squared, that's clearly greater than or equal to x plus x squared. And I have to tell, say why, right? It's because um, this term here, which is the difference, this term here right in the middle, um, is going to be greater than or equal to zero because x is greater than or equal to zero, right? So at this point, I now transition my equation into an inequality. I can say, therefore, um, take that left-hand side, bam, over here. And since it was equal to that term above, but now it's gonna be greater than, I'm replacing this left-hand or this, this right-hand side with something smaller, okay? So that's that. Um, I now go on to the next step. Like I said, I actually want a square root sign over everything on the right hand side, which I'll put in place right now. So I'll take the square root of that and um, I'll just end up with this on the right hand or the left hand side. Now, why can I do this? The reason why is because since x is going to be real, that's why you can take um, every the, the square, or the square root rather, of everything. If we had complex numbers flying around, you couldn't just make this inequality statement. And also, um, you need to go back to this because you couldn't take a square root um, if uh, you had, for example, some negative thing over here on the right-hand side. So um, if you had a negative in here, you couldn't take the square root and the whole thing would just explode. Uh, and at this point, we're pretty much done, right? I just need to factorize that thing underneath the square root and I am home. So I'll just take that x out, x plus one as required. 
Okay, so there was part two. Like I said, um, not many lines of working. You just need to think carefully about how you can get an expansion that'll do the job for you. <clears throat> okay, excuse me. Now, here comes the real, um, where the rubber really hits the road, as I mentioned in the beginning of the question, okay? We are now required to prove, required to, I'll keep it in the same sort of vein that I've done before. We're required to prove that this, um, this sequence, any arbitrary sequence within the term Sn, is gonna be greater than or equal to the square root of n factorial. Um, and everyone looks at that and is like, whoa, where did that come from? There was, didn't look like there was any combinatorics or anything like that within this question. Factorial is often weird people out, uh, but you're gonna see this is not too dramatic actually. We're gonna be able to work with this um, using induction. Uh, and then you can see we get given this particular um, set of restrictions on n, it's got to be greater than or equal to 1, and it's got to be an integer. Okay, now normally I would like to just go through this question um, as normally as I could, and then say, oh, I'm going to, um, uh, yes, well spotted, Emmanuel, by the way, sorry, that was a few minutes ago, I just didn't notice the chat. This is very similar to uh, a question that appeared in a previous trial. Um, this question here, the twist about this being, let's just go back, a second order recursive formula means that there's going to be a very significant difference about the way that we conduct our first two steps of this induction, right? We know how induction works. We test, we assume, and then we prove, right? You test the base case, you assume for an arbitrary case, and then you use that as your foundation for a proof, okay? But you can't do that for a second order formula, um, recursive formula in the same way. Here is why, right? Think about, for example, uh, think about how a normal induction um, proof works, right? When you do the test, and this is for like, say for example, n equals one, then we assume um, that the statement is true for n equals k, and then what we do is we prove that the tr statement is true for n equals k plus one. When you do this normally, when you're proving it for n equals k plus one, you obviously refer straight back to your inductive hypothesis, right? Um, because you will find the n equals k statement somewhere hiding within the n equals k plus one statement. And that's usually the way, um, like a lot of your algebraic effort is to find where that is or to simplify what you get after you use that result. But because this is a second order recursive formula, when you have a look at any step, like it could be the fourth or the fifth or the sixth step or the hundredth step, right? You're not just gonna look back at one previous step. The whole point of it being a second order formula is you're actually gonna look back another step, right? You're not just gonna look at n equals k, you're gonna look at the, um, the term before that, right? And so you need to actually have two successive terms for um, your inductive hypothesis. And because when you're finished, right, you're gonna say, oh, because my, my base case works, your base case also has to have two steps in it because any, any arbitrary um, um, step along the way of your, of your sequence, Sn, has to have the previous two steps that it can stand upon, right? So unlike just going one step at a time like a normal induction does, this one you have to have your foot firmly planted on two previous steps. So that means, and lots of people missed this when they were doing this um, question in the HSC, <clears throat> that means when we do our test, um, the first thing I hope all of you reflexively did was, well, I'm just gonna test n equals one. It's not that big a deal, right? Um, the left-hand side gives you one, and the right-hand side, the square root of one factorial, it also gives you one. So therefore, yeah, it, it checks out S1 is greater than or equal to the square root of one factorial, tick. But that's not enough. The first, um, the first n equals one is not enough to make the base case. The base case actually has to have two things in it because if you want to progress from that to go further, you need S2 as well as, as a minimum, right? So therefore I also have to test n equals two. Thankfully it is just as little amount of work. You can say, well S2 by definition is two. Um, the square root of two factorial is the square root of two. So like 1.4-ish, right? So therefore is two bigger than 1.4-ish? And the answer is, yeah, of course it is. So S2 is indeed bigger than the square root of two factorial. So tick, now I'm done. This, these, both of these terms are my base case, okay? As I've already mentioned, the same thing is true for when I make my assumption, right? And if you only assumed for, um, for one thing, when you went on to do your proof, you would have been like, uh-oh, what do I do here? When I start doing substitutions, you're like, I need to go back another step and you're missing um, a, a term that you can actually substitute in, right? So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna say right here that it's not just true for n equals k, I wanna go one more step and then my proof step will include both of these, right? So I mean, I could do it, 
I could have gone back one more, n equals k minus one, but you know, negatives, gross. Um, so I'm just gonna go forward, and it just means that when I do my proof step, it won't be k plus one, it'll be k plus two, the next one along, okay? So in other words, what does your assumption tell you? Um, for n equals k, it's that sk is gonna be greater than the square root of k factorial, and for the other one, um, the next one over, it'll be sk plus one is greater than or equal to um, the square root of k plus one factorial, okay? So that was the big difference. From there, I think if you have this foundation, it, like if you realize that this twist has this different implication for your test and your assumption, you should be pretty okay um, for, like and I've given you this massive head start on me, so um, I, I hope if you haven't, if you didn't get the solution yourself in the breakouts, you'll be able to get it now, but let me, let me talk you through it.